Hi there, I'm Judy Holland, and welcome to Happy Nest, the podcast where you can hear the latest research and best advice for living well when your kids leave home. Join me as I interview experts and explore how to reinvent yourself during this critical passage. I hope you'll head over to judyhollandauthor.com and check out my new book, Happy Nest, Finding Fulfillment When Your Kids Leave Home. I'm here today with Randy Schrader, a pastor, couples counselor, and family therapist. Randy is also the author of a new book, Simple Habits for Marital Happiness, Practical Skills and Tools that Build a Strong, Satisfying Relationship. Why do 50% of marriages end in divorce and 70% of married couples say they're unhappy? Listen in to this episode to hear tips from Dr. Randy. Today, we welcome Randy Schrader to the Happiness Podcast. So glad you could be here today with us. Judy, it is my privilege and pleasure to be with you. I am looking forward to uh, discussing simple habits for marital happiness and other topics that you may choose. And that is hot off the press, right? You told me that that was just published mid-month in March. So you are right just out of the box. Just out of exactly two weeks ago today. Oh, good. Off the press. Good deal. Well, let's jump right in then. So, Randy, tell me, what are your top tips for marital happiness? Well, I'm going to give you a generalization first, uh, Judy, and say that what happens with so many couples is they, on their wedding day, brides and grooms are confident they're going to have a loving, happy marriage. And uh, they don't realize that marriage is a journey. It's not a destination, and they need to keep working at it. And so the, the best tip that I always start with when I see couples, and I probably, Judy, have helped, more than 1,500 couples achieve a happy marriage as I talk about overcoming complacency and never, never, never taking your spouse for granted, never taking your marriage for granted, and basically just being a boyfriend and a girlfriend to your spouse throughout your married life together. Randy, why do we become complacent with regard to a romantic relationship? What's with that? Well, I, I think what happens is once two individuals, the bride and groom, put their name on the marriage license. They believe that their job is done and they can stop growing as a spouse, improving as a spouse. They stop valuing their partner and, and stop loving them and making them feel special. And I, I've been married 45 years, knowing my wife 47 years. I need to be a boyfriend to my wife today. She needs to be a girlfriend to me. And that's not an obligation. That's a privilege. It's a privilege for me to value and make my wife feel special today as a boyfriend. That's great. I love the way of thinking of that. And that's a really good, simple way of thinking of it, that treat your spouse like a girlfriend or a boyfriend. And then that way I don't have this huge, long list, but I can, it's pretty clear in my mind, like what that would be, as opposed to a huge, long list of things that are going to blow my mind, especially in the time of COVID. Let me bring you back to that. Randy, how would you adjust these tips in these times of social distancing and quarantining? Is there, you know, we're all, we got a, we got a weird twist on things. We're in this twilight zone, Randy. Yeah, no, I, and that is a great question, Judy, because uh, a lot of couples right now can be struggling through the social distancing and being quarantined. And I think what especially needs to happen, what's at the heart of a marriage is expectations. You know, today you and your husband have expectations about what's going to happen throughout this day. My wife and I have expectations. And so one of the ways, one of the best tips I think to cope is especially being together in the house is to lay out the expectations that you have for each other throughout this day. What are your wants? What are your needs? Because unknown expectations lead to hurt and disappointment. Unmet expectations lead to heartache and heartburn. And so laying out the expectations right away in the morning can make a significant difference in keeping us connected to our spouses and strengthening our oneness throughout this day. That's wonderful. Um, Randy, what lessons might we learn? I'm obviously not to be throwing any more cliches. I think I already hit you with two and I'm totally opposed to cliches, but what lessons, what, what silver lining, what lessons might we learn from this pandemic that could strengthen our relationships? Well, I, I think there's a lot of lessons, both relationship-wise and even individually. 
certainly uh, setbacks are the best route to success. And I think one of the things couples need to do and individuals need to do is think about all the good things in this life and think about the good things in our relationships. I mean, we live in the greatest country in the world. How many other countries are going to give individuals $1,200 if they make less than $75,000 and $2,400 if they make less than $150,000? I mean, that is such a blessing. And to look and dwell on the good things in life individually and live for today as a couple and, and live one day at a time, be enthusiastic about life and then uh, setting some, some specific goals. And I could talk about those. I have suggested I'm doing a couple of phone counseling sessions today with two individuals and I can give you some suggestions there if you'd like, Judy. Sure, knock them right off. Bullet point style, well, Randy, bullet, just like a journalist. Point, uh, no, I, I would <laughs> say that to go overboard on compliments right now is essential good and to have humor and not sarcasm sarcasm can hurt relationships in a heartbeat and when we're together all the time it's easy to be sarcastic and i suggest to all couples to never be sarcastic and then the number seven in the bible stands for completion and so i think of doing things on a daily basis maybe in sevens to kind of complete our relationship so smile at our spouses seven times today. Uh, give uh, our spouses seven kisses. Give them seven hugs. Hold hands seven different times throughout the day. Talk for seven consecutive minutes with the cell phone in the other room, the TV off, the radio off, and just think of doing things in seven. So it's little bites because uh, too much space to time together, we all need space is not healthy, but to do things in the sevens, like what I mentioned, the smile, the kiss, the hug, hand holding, talking can really kind of de-stress us during these social distancing time. Absolutely. Great. That's a good deal. Sevens. That's good. I like the number seven. Randy, how do you change bad habits into good habits to strengthen a marriage? In a nutshell, of course, I'm asking you to encapsulize what you've done like over the years, but give it to me like, bam, what do you got? Well, and and that is an excellent question as well, because uh, we do want to replace our bad habits with good habits. In my book, Simple Habits for Marital Happiness, That is my goal. I have seven chapters that looks at 90 little tips, little habits that can make a difference. But it's not just eliminating a bad habit. It's having the skills, the knowledge, the tools to put in good habits. And as with any habit, I would say, Judy, we want to practice, 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 practice. And don't expect perfection from ourselves or from our spouses or from our marriage. Just give each other grace and mercy. And what I always suggest to couples when they come in is that your goal and my goal is to improve 1% per week as a spouse and 1% per week as a couple. And sometimes if there's a real difficult, bad habit to overcome, sometimes that improvement, Judy, is 1% per month, which is only 12% a year. But hopefully it can be 1% per week. And then that means at the end of the year, we're 50% healthier with that new positive habit, good habit that's going to strengthen our marriage relationship. 1%. I like that. That doesn't sound intimidating, Randy. That sounds like, okay, I can just carve off that little piece, right? You're not asking me to do, you're not asking me, Randy, for 90% better, 1%, right? I can, I can handle that, right? (laughs) Sure. And I, and we all can handle 1% per week. And again, give ourselves grace. If we don't achieve that 1% this week, hopefully we'll get that 1% next week with that healthier habit that's going to strengthen the oneness with our uh, spouse. Absolutely. Randy, what are the top problems, just top few in marriage that you hear about in your counseling service? Are you, are, are there patterns that recur? Sure. Sure. I, I think uh, in my, the first chapter in my book, I have 12 simple tips, understanding, apologizing and forgiveness. I, I would say that the one skill that people don't have is how to apologize to each other and forgive each other. Mm -hmm. My mom and dad were married 51 years before my mom went to heaven, and I uh, never saw my mom and dad apologize to each other or forgive each other. Now, I can put the best construction on things and say maybe that happened in the the bedroom but when we weren't around, but I doubt it. I don't think they knew how to do that. And I asked couples, 
I probably, I say I've helped over 1,500 couples achieve a happy marriage, probably closer to 2,000. I asked them, have you ever seen moms, dads, grandparents apologize and forgive each other? And the answer almost always is no. Uh, and I'm not being critical of my parents or other parents. It's just that they didn't learn how to do that. And yet, without forgiveness, it is impossible to have lifelong satisfying relationships. My wife and I, I mean, I'm a marriage expert. I'm going to hurt my wife's feelings. Most of the time it's unintentional, but sometimes it can be intentional. You know, I'm human. I'm imperfect. I'm flawed. My wife can hurt my feelings. What's going to glue our relationship back together is being able to apologize to each other, forgive each other, and leave the past in the past. So I would say that is probably a huge problem because number one, because bitterness builds up when there's not apologizing and forgiving, and that leads to an emotional disconnect and unfortunately sometimes even divorce. Yeah. Uh, I, I think another major problem area in marriage, Judy, is not having disagreement guidelines. Couples not knowing how to discuss their differing opinions and keep it at the mutual respect level. My definition of a disagreement is mutual respect for a differing opinion. I always say three synonyms that are not healthy are arguments, which are two people yelling at each other, fights, two third graders hitting each other on the playground, and conflicts or two countries going to war. We don't want to go to war in our marriages. And yet most couples do simply due to a lack of knowledge, a lack of skill, a lack of disagreement guidelines. And if issues are not resolved, again, that builds bitterness in the heart, and that also, that unforgiveness uh, puts a wedge in the relationship. So that's a second big one as well, a lack of disagreement guidelines. Mm -hmm. So that's interesting. I'm going to go back to apologizing, and certainly I know just personally, I mean, that's a, you got to really kind of bite your tongue and spit it out to apologize. Why do you think it's so difficult, Randy, for human beings who have perhaps crossed some kind of a line and or, or uttered a, a negative remark to somebody. Why is it so tough for us to apologize? What's, what's that about? Well, I think there can be a number of factors. I, I mean, it can be, like I said, we didn't have that model for us in our own moms and dads and grandparents. Sometimes pride, you know, can cause us to say, you know, I don't really need to, to tell my wife that I'm sorry I hurt your feelings. And a lot of times I would say, Judy, it's just not knowing the process and, and, and how to apologize. And so I always suggest to couples that you can apologize for wrong actions or unhealthy words by saying, I'm sorry I hurt you by saying X, Y, Z, or I'm sorry I hurt you by doing ABC. And so they just don't know how to do that. And secondly, I would say uh, it's a matter of sometimes we don't agree with our spouse that about that that was not a wrong thing I did. And we can also, or new, I shouldn't say also, it's important that we apologize for feelings. You know, if my wife says to me, Randy, I feel hurt when you said ABC and I don't agree with her. If I don't apologize, that hurts our marriage. I can also, in this first step, say, I'm sorry I hurt your feelings. Her feelings are her feelings and not really damage our marriage by not saying, oh, I'm not going to apologize. I don't agree with you. Right. And, and so we, we apologize for words and actions mm -hmm. and we apologize for feelings. But the important part, Judy, is to always seek forgiveness. It just amazes me how by asking, will you please forgive me, can heal a marriage relationship? Because if all we say is I'm sorry, that can become flippant where we say, I'm sorry I hurt you by saying this. I'm sorry I hurt you by doing this. But if I have to ask my wife, will you please forgive me? And then the, the, what heals the whole relationship is to use the forgive word, the third part. And for the a spouse to say, I forgive you. Or if it was really something painful, say adultery, to say with God's help, I will work at forgiving you because forgiveness is a process. I mean, it can go on and on. And actually, Judy, I'll just share with you my doctoral dissertation, my PhD dissertation was on apologizing and forgiving the benefits for marriage. And I wrote 370 pages. Wow. On apologizing and forgiving. I read a ton of books, read a ton of articles, 
went through the whole Bible and then wrote 370 pages. So my first chapter is on apologizing, forgiving. And of course, it's just the Reader's Digest version <laughs> of my uh, dissertation. But yeah, it, it is huge. But people, in answer to your question, just don't know how to do the three parts. I'm sorry I hurt you. Will you please forgive me? And then I forgive you. And, and let me say this as well, Judy, that most couples, healthy, happy couples, are unable to apologize the same day. For me, wow. being a marriage expert and writing my dissertation on apologizing, forgiving, when I hurt my wife's feelings unintentionally or intentionally, I usually can do it the same day. I'm not patting myself on the back, but it's because I understand it. But I would say 99% of spouses wait till the next day <laughs> and to do that. And that's fine as well, you know, where we kind of build up the strength to say, hey, I need to say, I'm sorry I hurt your feelings, or I'm sorry I said this. Right, but there's a benefit to jumping right out of the box. I think I've read um, in the past about not, if something blows up, it's really a good idea not to not to sleep on it overnight, right? It's better if you can fix it that same day before the sun goes down, That that that's a good idea. Well, it, it is, Judy, and uh, sometimes that can lead to bigger blowups. And, and sometimes it, it just depends on the spouse. It depends on the marriage. And so one size doesn't fit all. But yeah, if you, if you can heal hurts the same day, wonderful. But if, if you can't, then the next day, do the apologizing for giving. Good deal. Well, here, well, let me bring you, let me pull you, Randy, toward empty nesters. I'm an empty nester, three kids out of the house. And my book, Happy Nest, Finding Fulfillment When Your Kids Leave Home, is explores m many of the challenges that empty nesters face. And, and one central, very central part of that is marriage. So, yeah. so, so talk to me about empty nesters. Do you have tips from your years of counseling people and writing dissertation materials. Oh, do you have tips for, for people once their kids go? Do they face different challenges? What are you hearing? They do. And I, I hope, uh, Judy, that your listeners will buy your book because you're more the expert on happy <laughs> efforts than me. <laughs> but I'm not But I'm not a therapist. I, I, I am not a therapist. That. So that's why I'm asking you. But, but yeah, I, I think uh, it goes back to doing the things that happened before the wedding day and, and, and talking about memories that happened then and just reconnecting. And the sad to say, the empty nest syndrome leads to often divorce and a, and a huge group today that have been married 25 to 35 years, 25 to 40 years are uh, getting divorced because their oneness has been broken. And so one of the things I think couples can do in the empty nest is just focus on the three T's, time together, talk together, touch together, and just talk about those areas, time, talk, and touch. And then I suggest to all couples, but especially empty nesters, to think also about three thoughts in those three areas. What do we need to keep doing? What do we need to start doing? And what do we need to quit doing? So in other words, there, there's a new beginning and so let's take uh, time together. You know, a husband and wife talk about now, what do we need to keep doing in terms of our time together that we're empty nesters? What do we need to start doing in terms of us being empty nesters? And uh, what do we need to quit doing in terms of time together? And then look at that also with talk together and touch together. And that can really open up the lines of communication and strengthen that oneness in a, a husband and wife as they now have a fresh start again to, to bond together and connect together. Oneness, that's a cool idea. So they lose the oneness. Sometimes you think with all the chaos and the children and the soccer practices and the homework and the math test, you, you get caught up in a tornado. And yes, indeed, there is, according to the Gottman Institute, I'm sure you're familiar with John Gottman. Oh, sure. John Gottman has measured a two-thirds drop in marital satisfaction during the child rearing years because you're in a you're in the middle of a circus sometimes, like it or not. And maybe not with an only child, but I have multiple kids and it is a circus, right? <laughs> no, it is. And and uh, child care and granted they as they get older they don't require as much care, but still they take focus. Child care takes time and that's time away from the marriage. And uh, a marriage is like a love bank account. Uh, there are deposits and there's withdrawals. And when those deposits are going more into the kids rather than the marriage, that leads to 
a low bank account. And a low bank account can uh, eventually sometimes keep going down and lead to bankruptcy, which would, of course, be divorce. And so, yeah, it's just crucial for couples to realize that over the years of caring for kids, their deposits went down. And one of the things I uh, share with individuals is that when kids are at home, the best uh, or couples, I should say, Judy, when kids are at home, the best a marriage can be is a B minus because again, the focus is on children. And the best a marriage ever is, is an A minus because we're all imperfect and flawed. And so if couples, in fact, I tell couples, if you have a C plus B minus marriage, God bless you, that, that's doing well. But if once the children leave home, a lot of marriages are not C plus B minus, which is pretty, pretty dead gum good when kids are at home, they're down at D plus C, C minus or D. And now they have to really work hard to get that marriage grade back up there through uh, more and more deposits. Some of the things I've already mentioned. Right. Absolutely. So what you're talking about is the phenomena of gray divorce, the boom, the fastest growing segment of the divorce market is certainly the over 50. I've interviewed a lot of experts and done a lot of research on that. It's, it's bracing and it's a, it's a really tough place to be with your spouse and your kids disappear at about the same time. And many experts and psychologists that I've interviewed um, from one end of the country to uh, another will discuss the issue with a kid-centric marriage, which is why the oneness word was interesting to me, because the oneness is inevitably busted wide open, uh, cleaved apart when you are so kid-centric. And I'm all about, I have gone to the wall with my kids, but certainly one of my therapists that that I interviewed from my book talks about how when you really put yourself second and you put that marriage second and and a distant second, that's where it's in danger. And that's what we're seeing in all the, the divorce figures of those with, with uh, gray highlights, right? <laughs> Judy, you, Judy, you said it so very, very well. And I agree 100% with what you said and what other therapists and psychologists have said as well. Yeah, the focus is not there and that oneness gets broken. And then uh, unfortunately, sometimes that brokenness cannot be or that oneness cannot be glued back together and that's where again apologizing forgiving and and having the skills and the tools and the tips to strengthen a marriage everybody wants to have a happy marriage but motivation is not enough and and that's what they forget and that's why my book simple habits for marital happiness overcomes that problem of just saying motivation is sufficient it's not you got to have the knowledge the skills the tools like healthy disagreement guidelines, how do you apologize and forgive each other, and then understanding that process, and, and as well as other uh, skills and tools. Uh, Randy, what about date your mates? I dug that out of your, that, that term. You've got a not, lot of nice alliteration in one, two, three, and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You've got some good ways to think simply about improving a marriage. What's what's date your mates? That You have a plan? That, Suggestions? That's it. That, that is actually uh, a significant way that happy nesters and uh, all couples can strengthen their relationship. And, and one of the things that I do in Simple Habits for Marital Happiness, all couples, Judy, know the importance of date your mate, but they do not understand how to make that fun and enjoyable and filled with deposits, not withdrawals. And so what I suggest to couples is that when there's kids at home, kids at home, they need to go on two dates a month for one hour. When there are no kids at home for uh, you and I, Judy, in our situation with our spouses, we need to go on a weekly date. And I also suggest to couples that they alternate picking dates. You know, one week it's the, or one time it's the husband's responsibility to pick the date and take care of all the responsibilities, Uh, making the reservations. If there's kids at home, finding a babysitter, and then the next week, it's the wife's responsibility or the next time it, because it's twice a month for those with kids. For you and I, it would be every other week. You know, we're uh, every other time we're making the, that decision. And then on a date you mate, there's never, never any problem talk. I've seen couples that have strengthened their oneness on the way to the date, during the date. And then at, on the way home, somebody brought up an issue, huge withdrawal and they didn't talk to each other for two days so it needs to be a bonding oneness strengthening time when they do a date your mate and the other thing i'd suggest to couples is that they think outside the box 
and do different things. I could give you three quick examples. I saw a couple with kids married 10 years that on the first date they went fishing and uh, sat in a boat two hours. I'll never forget it. They came in, Judy, and said, Dr. Schrader, that's the best time we've had together in 10 years. <laughs> I, saw, I saw a second couple, the wife. And by the way, when the whoever picks the date, they're picking a date that their spouse will enjoy. Not that they will enjoy. They're uh -huh. making their spouse feel special and valued. And so I can think of a husband who did not like Chinese food. And when I went over dates your mate and I had him pick the first date, where did he take his wife on the first date? His wife loved Chinese food. That was one of her favorite dishes. Where did he take her on the first date? <clears throat> to a Chinese restaurant. Nice Chinese restaurant. And I don't know if he had dessert for his entree <laughs> and dessert for dessert. <clears throat> but he felt so loved and valued that he took her uh, – to a Chinese restaurant and, and was self-sacrificing. When we're picking the date, we're self-sacrificing and helping our partner feel special. Saw another couple that, again, married about 20 years and the wife loved to fly kites as a girl. And the husband then, when it was his turn to pick the date, bought two box kites, I think for $5 and they flew kites for two hours. And they came in and said basically the same thing. We have not had that much fun in 10 years. And, uh, Final example I'll mention real quick on a date you made. I saw a couple, very affluent couple, had a lot of money. On the first date, husband picked it, and uh, he had a pickup, or they had several vehicles, but he did have a truck, and he put a foam mattress in the back of the truck. This was during the summer, and uh, he drove his wife out into the country. So, again, didn't spend any money, but thought outside the box, did something fun for his wife, and they laid on that foam mattress for two hours, held hands, looked up at the stars in the moon, and one of the best times, they'd, they've been married almost 45 years, one of the best times they had together in their marriage life was just laying out there on the foam mattress in the truck and enjoying time together. And so it's good to think outside the box on date your mate, but be self-sacrificing, have no problem talk, and then alternate picking dates. So both husband and wife are accepting responsibility for putting some fun back into the relationship. So that truck, that pickup truck idea would work on love in the time of COVID, which is now resonating in my, <laughs> in my, in my ear. And yeah. that would work now, but I'm challenging your creativity right now because Randy, I can't go to a movie with my husband. I, I can't even walk down to the, to the national mall and see the cherry blossoms because they've put the kibosh on that. So we're going to yeah. have to, now that we're more housebound for a temporary period of time, we have to remind ourselves, have you got some ideas for creative days? your mates in the house and and many of us again i have three young adults two boomeranged back from college that colleges that close their doors and and a singer songwriter who escaped nashville which is plundered after the tornado preceding the was, uh, the rest of it so what do you think tragic. yeah they, i would suggest what couples do is rather than you know i mentioned getting a one-hour date for those with kids is do 10-minute dates and do a 10-minute date every day and one day the husband picks the 10 minute date. The next day the wife picks the 10 minute date. And uh, when, when we go through tougher times, the more valuable humor becomes and not sarcastic humor. Again, sarcasm is making somebody the butt of a joke. We don't want to do that. And so I suggest to couples, and it would be more than my 10 minute date, but to sit down on the sofa and watch a, a 30 minute comedy television show or watch a comedy movie, or uh, talk about some of the most meaningful times in their marriage for 10 minutes. Uh, talk about some of the fun memories of what they did when they were dating before they got married. Take out right now the uh, wedding pictures, whether somebody's been married one year or someone has been married 50 years. Take out the wedding album and look at pictures together for 10 minutes and talk about the, the wedding. And so just to make it brief, and at the same time, I say, you know, spending time together, sometimes it's important, Judy, for uh, couples to get a little space. And maybe on different hours of the day, they're in different rooms. One's in the office, one's in the kitchen or in the bedroom or whatever, but to not get too much time together. And then 
depending on where you where a person or a couple lives if they can go outside and walk around their street or their sidewalk for five ten minutes again just holding hands just to get out of the side outside and get some fresh air that can make a significant difference as well right absolutely so you don't i've done a bunch of research and writing about not quote unquote suffocating your spouse and absolutely yeah. we do need our own time we need our own passions we need our own separate time to develop and and thrive and kind of be on our on our own path and certainly that is a little more challenging as we're temporarily in closer quarters what about um bring me big picture now you've had a lot of time to sort of deal with listen to people and counsel people on uncertainty and troubled times wrapping up here randy what what words of wisdom have you got to offer for dealing with the uncertainty that we face today the the to recognize that my, my fa- favorite question in life is uh, what does it matter five years from now? When you and I, Judy, go back to March 30th, 2015, we can't remember what was stressing us out. When we go back to March 2015, we can't remember what was stressing us out. Probably even the year 2015, unless we had a loved one who died, uh, we can't remember. And so five years from now, when we're at 2025, what I believe we're gonna do as the United States of America is we're gonna learn from this setback. And and we're going to not let this setback be anything more than a route to success. Great people bounce back and never give up. Great countries bounce back and never give up. And, And I truly believe what you and I need to do and all your listeners, all of us, we need to live for today and make a masterpiece of today. And in that regard, refuse to feel sorry for ourselves. The other day, I had a situation that caused me to feel sorry for myself. We just can't do that. We need to live one day at a time and be enthusiastic about living this day. I mean, it's been my joy and privilege and pleasure to be with you this morning, Judy, and and just to enjoy our time together and enjoy our time with our spouses and, and think about the good things in life and then be a giver, not a taker. You know, how can we give to others? Is there somebody we can FaceTime with or call on the phone or send an email to that can be an encouragement to them. Wonderful. I love this. And this is going to continue to resonate and echo in my ears, make a masterpiece of today. I like that. That's a nice, simple idea with a nice visual to it. So Randy Schrader, I'm so delighted you were able to fit us in today at Happy Nest. Randy is a pastor, a couples counselor and family therapist. Correct, Randy? And, Correct. And he has penned and just published a Simple Habits for Marital Happiness, Practical Skills and Tools that Build a Strong, Satisfying Relationship. Thank you so much for taking the time and for articulating these things in such a nice, easy to follow, one through seven, one through three kind of plan with some alliteration mixed in too. Well, thank you, Judy. <laughs> it was my pleasure to be with you and stay healthy and God's blessings to you and your family. Thanks a lot. Thanks for tuning into my happiness podcast, where we explore how to get the best out of the empty nest. I hope you'll subscribe, write a review, and reach out to me on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Check out my website, judyhollandauthor.com. Have a great day, and remember, make it happen.